Since 1967, we have been protecting the public's right to know, serving as a watchdog for openness and credibility for Hawaii Island. Anyone can join the club, journalists, photographers, videographers, those in PR, or anyone that is committed to open government, freedom of information, and freedom of the press. Throughout the year, we host these newsmaker luncheons where we have guest speakers discuss something topical with our club and our guests. The Big Island Press Club also operates a 501c3 nonprofit foundation that awards scholarships every year to students pursuing higher education in journalism and related careers. Throughout the year, we also tackle various legislative issues at the county and state levels, dealing with media access, media communication, journalist shield laws, freedom of information, and sunshine law. On our website at thebigislandpressclub.org, you can join our club, learn about, and buy tickets to our events, which are both on the Hilo and Kona sides of the island, apply for a scholarship, or make a tax-deductible donation to our scholarship fund. Uh, speaking of this scholarship, uh, you'll see some more information on our website. Uh, we'll be hosting a dinner celebrating this year's scholarship winners at the Seaside Restaurant in Hilo. And Nancy, that is on uh, May, which day in May? Thursday, May 11th. Thursday, May 11th. Yes. Uh, we'll have an exciting uh, guest speaker there and we'll be celebrating the scholarship winners. Uh, if you know someone who'd like to apply for the scholarship, now's the time to apply. Uh, the deadline to apply for the scholarships is April 20th. Uh, information on how to apply for the scholarship is on uh, BigIslandPressClub.org. Uh, information on how to apply. Uh, the whole application process is online, and that's for students on the island pursuing a career in journalism or related fields. And uh, the website also provides the ability for people uh, to donate. Um, one person here, I want to just give a brief shout out to Rod Thompson, made a very generous contribution to our scholarship fund. So thank you, Rod, who's hiding under his napkin. Thank you so much for that. So today we have this awesome panel assembled to chat about the flow of information before, during, and after the Mount Loa eruption of 2022. Uh, Dane DuPont joins us from Hawaii Tracker. Dane is a computer science graduate from the University of Hawaii at Hilo with a background in network and information security. He has acted as the primary Hawaii Tracker administrator since 2019, moderating and producing content online that is seen on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. For the 22 eruption, Dane produced 20 live videos with over 22 hours of runtime. In 2019, Hawaii Tracker received the Big Island Press Club's first ever Excellence in Media Innovation Award for its innovative and consistent outreach during the 2018 Kilauea eruption. At the other end of the table is Jessica Farrakane. Jessica joins us from Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. As the public affairs specialist for the park, Jessica serves as the chief media contact for the 333,086-acre national park. Her duties include, but aren't limited to, creating and distributing park press releases, reviewing film and photography permit requests, coordinating VIP visits, and assisting in crisis communications and consulting with management. Uh, next on this side is Ken Hahn from USGS. As a scientist in charge of Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, HVO, 
Ken leads about 30 staff to fulfill their mission to monitor the active volcanoes in Hawaii, assess their hazards, issue warnings, and advance scientific understanding to reduce the impacts of volcanic eruption. Ken has a PhD from the University of Colorado, Boulder. Ken was previously an HBO volcanologist from 1987 to 1990. At that time, he was researching how lava flow inflation and shear rates affect lava flow morphology and applied the concepts to assist with hazard and risk mitigation as lava flowed into Kalapana in 1990. Next to Ken is Chris Leonard. Chris Leonard joins us from New West Broadcasting Corp, where he is the president and general manager. New West Broadcasting is a locally owned broadcast company that owns and operates six radio stations in Hilo and Kona, including KWXX, B97, B92, and KPUA. Chris is also the president of the Hawaii Association of Broadcasters, a trade group that the Big Island Press Club has been working closely with on the legislative front to protect the media's ability to share information in an emergency. Chris also serves as the chairman of the Hawaii State Emergency Communications Committee and as a member of our local Emergency Planning Committee for Hawaii County. Not here today is uh, Tomage Magno, Magno, the uh, Administrator for Civil Defense. Unfortunately, he's under the weather and, and couldn't join us, uh, but I did want to give a shout out to Tomage for um, willing to be here on this panel today. Uh, also, last but not least, is Philip Ong. Philip joins us from Hawaii Tracker. A self-proclaimed citizen geologist, Philip became well-known on the island for his role as a science communicator on Hawaii Tracker during the 2018 Lower East Rip Zone eruption of Kilauea. However, Philip's experience with Hawaii's volcanoes started well before then. In 1999, Philip served as a field assistant to a senior thesis student working with Hawaii Volcanoes Observatory. He soon returned as an HBO volunteer. The next year, Philip completed a Bachelor of Science degree in both computer science and geological and earth sciences and geoscience from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In 2004, he completed his Master's in Geological and Earth Science and Geoscience from the University of Michigan after wrap wrapping up a brief contracted role with USGS and their seismology division. Philip decided to stay and make a living of being around the world's most active and most visited volcanoes. So there you have it, our incredible panel today. Some, some members of the press club were actually concerned about having this panel because we thought this may trigger an eruption. <laughs> having everyone here. But at around 11.30 p.m. on Sunday, November 27th, lava broke to the surface within the summit caldera at Mauna Loa for the first time in 38 years. Roughly seven hours later, the summit eruption transitioned to fissures along the northeast rip zone. Several lava flows traveled in the northeast and east direction from there, crossing the Mauna Loa Weather Observatory Road. Lava came within 1.7 miles of Saddle Road before the eruption ended on December 13th. So, Ken, you're, I have a, a, my first question for you. And um, so in the months before the November 27th eruption, um, you and your team knew something was up. At what point did you and your team see more than typical background noise in your deck? Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, I mean, we've been working on this actually since I took the job at HBO, which was in February of 2021. And there was actually, I don't know if you guys remember, but we actually had kind of an alert that went out to the public at that time as well. Because what we saw, even though Mauna Loa was slowly inflating and seismicity was high and stuff, we saw a blip on top of it. And that's how eruptions start. They emerge out of these other conditions, right? So you have to have a favorable set of conditions. And then something will start to emerge, and then that makes the likelihood of the eruption a lot more. 2021, we didn't see all the indicators we saw in 2022. So what we did was I called Talmadge and I called uh, Rhonda over at the National Park, the superintendent, and I just said, hey, I don't want to alarm you guys, but Mauna Loa is doing something different. We should pay attention. Right? We paid attention for a while, and then there was a really interesting event on Mauna Loa in 2020 where it inflated, the earthquakes picked up, and then all of a sudden there was an extensional event the, the volcano, if you want to think of it, it's, it's blowing up like a balloon, but it's not really a balloon, there's solid around it. So it kind of popped and it made space, 
and that took the pressure off of the chamber and it died back down again. So that was ramping up for something and then it died off. So we watch for those things all the time. Just kind of think of it as like we get into periods where you want to call it eruption weather or whatever, where there's the conditions are set up that this could happen and we start watching. It, it got quieter for another year after that. And then in the summer of 2022, things started to pick up again. And actually on August 2nd at 3 in the morning, we had the earthquakes ramp up to like 100 uh, earthquakes per day. So we had a whole bunch of earthquakes on Mauna Loa beneath the summit at 3 in the morning. And we just sat there and kind of watched it. We didn't tell anyone else about it while it was happening because we are going, is this worth waking anybody up? Mm -hmm. No, not yet. And then... That died down, it only lasted for four hours, and it died down, and Mauna Loa went back to the normal ramping up. But in the middle of September of uh, last year, what we saw are a couple of things. We saw the earthquakes, again, spike really heavily up to this, like, 100, 150 earthquakes a day. And when we talk about those numbers of earthquakes, those are the ones we can locate. So they're big enough to show up on more than three seismometers. So, you know, it's just like looking at something in the distance, right? If it's tiny, it's hard to see. If it's a tiny earthquake, it's hard to basically our seismometers hear or feel the vibrations of that earthquake, right? So, even though we say 100 a day, there were probably four or five times that many showing up on the seismometers that we couldn't locate. So the seismometers get really active when that goes off. And then the other thing that really got our attention, um, for the first time, the... We have tilt meters in the ground, and they're basically just like a level, like a carpenter's level, but they're electronic. So if the ground starts to tilt like this, then we know that it, the tilt meter will react. Well, before this, that tilt meter's been up there for like 10 years or something like that, and never did a darn thing. All it did was, like, it would get warm, and the rock would kind of do stuff. It would do a diurnal thing, so during the day, we're eating and cooling. And during seasons, like when it got cold and ice would get in it, it would cause the block to move and stuff like that. Well, all of a sudden that tilt meter woke up and started really inflating really fast. So it showed that the top of the mountain was pushing out like this, so the tilt meter tilted away. So when that tilt meter woke up, we knew something was going on. And the tilt meter, compared to our global positioning satellites, which are like drawing two dots on a balloon, those things take a measurement every day that's good to within a couple of millimeters. And they show this progressive stretching of the distance so the volcano was blowing up like a balloon. That's generally deeper. When the tilt meter took off and doing it, we knew something was shallow. And our geodesist, Ingrid, she modeled this. And in, sure enough, she came up with something coming up within about two kilometers of the surface um, and starting to expand. So. That's when we went on the kind of alert and talked to the Park Service, talked to Civil Defense. It's when the park closed down uh, the summit of Mauna Loa. And what we weren't doing was predicting an eruption. We were just seeing that the volcano activated, magma was in position, it was continuing to go. What we don't know is when the magma chamber is actually going to create a rupture that will allow the magma to get up to the surface and start erupting. So what we were looking for in that, again, is these little takeoffs. So that's what we were looking at before the eruption. It was sort of interrupted by the, if you live in Pahala, anybody here live in Pahala? There was a magnitude uh, 5 earthquake on October 14th that was preceded by 25 seconds by a 4 and a half. And it really shook the town, knocked lots of stuff off the shelves, caused a little bit of damage and stuff. That pop on the lower flank of Mauna Loa also appears to have made some room for magma, and things quieted down for a little bit after that, and then as soon as it filled the space that was made by that, they started ramping up again. So so it's, a, it's an iterative process anyways, and all we can say when we get into that is what we told people, that the, it's likely that Mauna Loa could erupt out of here, and when it does, what we know about Mauna Loa eruptions is that they occur very rapidly usually with an hour or less of warning uh, before lava hits the surface. So, Ken, both you, USGS, and Civil Defense teamed up for a road show of sorts leading up to that eruption, uh, informing communities at a risk, uh, sharing the current data, and what could happen when the volcano finally erupts. How did that series of meetings come to be, and how were the locations and the timing for the meeting selected? 
Yeah, well, first, you have to understand that we've been in constant communication. We've been meeting weekly for a year and a half. So it wasn't just something that just sort of spontaneously happened, you know. We knew that the volcano was in a state and we knew we had to be prepared and we knew that we have a very serious situation on the southern end of Mauna Loa, right, where the slopes are so steep and it's a beautiful place to live and people have built way up the sides of the volcano, well not way up actually, not very far up except in Ocean View, but still you can, you're getting close to where the lava can get to you, sometimes within just a matter of hours, but usually within 24 hours the lava will be in there. So. Um, the important thing in here to Talmadge and I, as we went through there, we, we had some messages that we wanted to bring out. And we developed these in the year or so beforehand, looking back at the past and, and then just looking at the situation that might evolve. We knew we had to make sure that people not only were listening for messages, but pretty much knew that they had to self-evacuate in some cases, you know? That they're, it's kind of like a local tsunami. You don't have a lot of time and you need to be aware of the signs and then be able to read it yourself and you know we'll be there messaging but you're not going to be waiting for someone to come knock on your door and politely tell you that you know oh you might want to be thinking about moving out at this point you know um, it's a very big area as we all know that you know going from Captain Cook South all the way around to Nalehu is a large chunk of territory there's not many people that live there there's not many police or firemen down there so in, to get People there within, you know, a matter of hours even is very difficult, especially at one in the middle of the So <clears throat> we talked about this. We went to the most vulnerable community first, which is Hawaii Ocean View Estates, and so we wanted to talk to them and make sure that they understood that they were aware of the condition that the volcano was in, that it was very likely that an eruption could emerge from this set of conditions with very very little warning. Right, so. We had Frank Truesdale on our staff, who's studied his entire career, the geology of Mauna Loa, and the eruptions of Mauna Loa, he's mapped most of Mauna Loa. So Frank gave most of the public presentations, and you know, it's his wonderful work that we have a lot of information about past behavior that allows us to at least come up with certain things. And Talmadge and I wanted to emphasize what we did know and didn't know. Thought that was really clear, you know, that people need to have some degree of certainty during a crisis, right? They need to know, what do I know, what don't I know, right? And in this day and age, as we all know it, sometimes that's not very clear. So I want to just give a big shout out to everybody in this room, and especially to Philip and Dane, for really helping make sure that people knew what the, our limitations are, what we could tell them, what we couldn't tell them, and help to get the messages out to more people than we normally would have access to. And everybody in this room that you know took part in the press, being partners, we have a wonderful set of press on this island, and in Hawaii in general, who are more interested in getting the correct information to people than they are you know, building up a story and trying to get readers to their website and stuff like that. There's a real conscientious effort to make sure that people are well informed before these things. So that is so crucial. and. Um, I can't thank you enough, because we can't do that, right? We can go to places, we can talk to people, but without you guys, our message would never get out. So, we knew that that we could tell people it's going to start in the summit, it's going to proceed into a rip zone, and then it'll stabilize on the rip zone, a lot of flow will emerge, and head down the slope. But we can't tell you exactly when it's going to start at the summit, we can't tell you when it's going to go to the rip zone, and we can't tell you when and where that lava flow is going down. So that was really important, and people did a really good job of getting that message out. That you know, but still, even that gives people some understanding. What I found over time is that what people want is to try to put their situation into some perspective to understand what is happening to them when it happens. If the, if it just seems like chaos, then people panic and they get very anxious and stuff. And while this doesn't make the situation any better. It at least gives them a framework of understanding that, okay, as soon as it starts erupting, and we saw this with the messaging out of Kona and stuff, that, you know, oh my God, it's going down the Southwest Rift Zone, and we had to keep messaging, no, it's not going down the Southwest Rift Zone, it's on the southern side of the summit right now, it hasn't started down there, you know, and keep reassuring people, and when it went to the Northeast Rift Zone, we kept reinforcing that, 
hey, it's on the northeast rift zone. People along the south don't have to worry anymore. It's not coming back. We know that. Okay, so we now we can't tell you that when it was going to go either way, but once it goes one way, what we can tell you is it's not going to come back and you're out of threat for this eruption, right? So we felt those messages were really important. The other message that was that we were really trying to do when we went out to the communities is make sure the local people got the information and make sure that the national and international press did not get control of the storyline. <laughs> so I think we all watched that happen in 2018, where the storyline got out of control and, you know, the island was flooded by lava and basically the whole island chain was flooded by lava and everyone should evacuate Hawaii now, you know. But it, it's also part of the not understanding, like I had people I worked with, I was working with the university at that time, they were asking, was well, it going to come into Hilo? And I'm going, no. But then you realize people don't know that. So those are the kinds of things that's really important. And, you know, when people were asking, is it going to come down to Hilo? Well, we just don't know at this point. It's uh, very unlikely it'll get to Hilo. But it still hasn't made up its mind which way it's going to go when the lava flow was sitting right on the boundary between the two watersheds. So we tried to make sure that people got answers to things and weren't sitting there in anxiety, right? We never mentioned the word Hilo or Kona when we were talking about the direction the lava flow might go, and that was very intentional. No, the lava flow's in the saddle, it's sitting in the middle of this area, it's just going to sit there, it's probably not going to go very far, you know? Was kind of our message, right? We also saw that from 2014 15 when they were trying out these forecasts of what, how, where the lava would be, and they would just say, if the lava goes at this rate, it would be here, here, and here, you know? And, but the lava doesn't always go at that rate, right? It changes. So we stayed away from that and just said, the lava's coming down, it's moving at this rate, unlikely that it's going to get to, you know, the road in the next few days, you know, that kind of thing. Behind the scenes, were we planning contingencies if it got to the road? Yeah, the Civil Defense was, and the Department of Highways and all sorts of people were involved in that. There was a huge number of people mobilized to make sure that the disruption to people on the island was minimized. But yeah, so those are the kind of things that we were thinking about. And, and again, your help in getting the calmer messages out and what's reality. Yeah, you live on this thing, it's half of the island. But the whole thing isn't going to overflow with lava, right? Where it comes down, it will be bad, but it comes down in ribbons, right? These kind of narrow ribbons of lava, so it's not going to cut off the whole island. Anyway, you can get me talking. I can talk for the rest of the afternoon, sorry. <laughs> we'll, we'll have a pay-per-view live stream with you. <laughs> so, Chris, Chris, so Hawaii is home to many potential disasters. Uh, Ken talked to a lot of the planning and the ongoing conference calls that would happen uh, long before the eruption happened. Um, so you're a member of both the Emergency Communications Committee and the Emergency Planning Committee. Can you tell us um, what those committees are and what they do and what kind of planning is happening ahead of emergency before it happens here in Hawaii? Uh, sure. Uh, radio guys should not open the microphone. Um, there's, uh, both committees, the State Emergency Communications Committee is, uh, is an NGO, it's a non-governmental organization that sits between uh, the feds and, and the state to help develop communication plans, make sure that the plan is, is uh, uh, federally authorized. Uh, we're, we're federal licensees, radio and television stations. Um, my involvement with it, I've been a committee member for a number of years, but the committee, quite frankly, has been inactive. I've been very uh, outspoken about the fact that the committee had been inactive. Uh, what really sort of changed things for us was our now infamous false missile issue, uh, which, uh, as I was explaining to somebody earlier, um, I, I, I did learn a valuable lesson out of that, um, that if you yell loud enough and long enough about a problem, somebody says, okay, fine, you fix it. Uh, which is how I ended up taking over as the chair. We, we uh, myself and, and our committee members, rewrote the state plan to get it federally compliant. Uh, the goal is to make sure that there are operations and procedures in place uh, to handle a number of federal level um, alerts. State and county level alerts are actually not mandated to be carried by broadcasters, but broadcasters will carry generally all of those in conjunction with what the state plan calls for. So if the state says, we're going to automatically pass emergency messages for flash flood warning, watch, 
hurricane warning watch, et cetera, volcano warning, uh, that those things go through, and most broadcasters will follow the recommendations of the state plan, not just here, but all across the country. Um, it also helps incorporate what the testing plans and procedures are, because unfortunately we can't schedule emergencies between 8 and 5, Monday through Friday, um, and the system is designed to work on an automated basis. So they can work with civil defense, and if we have an issue, they can push out an alert at 3 o'clock in the morning, whether stations are manned or unmanned at the time, uh, and they have access to basically all the radio stations and television stations in the state, and divide it up by county, so they can push to a region, at, at, down to the county level, or they can push statewide if an emergency warrants that. Um, as far as being prepared for specific incidents, um, my organization, our radio stations, we have some plans and procedures in place to staff up when situations arise. Something like this where we see something's happening, we start to have our staff in place on standby to um, address those issues and to be on call. Uh, we're in very regular communication with civil defense on these issues. To let us know what you need. We will be there if you need us to be there. Um, in this particular case, I was actually out of town when it happened. Um, I was in Santa Clara um, at 1 o'clock in the morning when my phone rang that Mama Lowell was erupting, and I was home by about 6 o'clock that afternoon on, on a vacation that was cut short. Um, I think most broadcasters um, are, are prepared to step up, um, but, the, but the industry has changed. There's less staff. So these plans and procedures are in place to allow emergency managers access to those systems when needed, whether a station is staffed or not staffed. Um, and I, I did want to add one other thing, and, I, and Ken touched on this, and I think it's really important, and I think many of you that are in this room play a very vital role in that. Um, the smooth flow and timely flow of information is absolutely critical. And in the absence of good information, um, the absence of good information doesn't just leave this void. That void will be filled with something. So to point about um, the national media changing the narrative, whether it's the national media or a blogger or somebody in between, if there is not a good flow of information from officials to the public, um, that void gets filled with something and generally it's not accurate. Um, so I think what, what many of you do and what many of you support is of vital and we want to try to ensure that that continues to happen that way. Jessica, so Ken touched on this before. So on October 6th, the park closed the summit backcountry to the public as a precautionary measure. Can you describe the process that happens behind the scenes to close the parks or portions of the parks due to volcanic activity? Yes, I can. Before I answer that question, I have to digress a little bit. Who saw this eruption? Was it not the most spectacular thing? I just have to take a moment out and appreciate the beauty of the spectacle of this eruption. I was a high school senior at Kalaheo on Oahu in 84 when Mauna Loa last erupted. And just to see this happen and then have a dual eruption, I just wanted to take a minute and just like, as a group, have the gratitude of what an amazing thing we got to see and that it really didn't do that much damage overall. So, okay, what was your question? I'm kidding. <laughs> How does the park uh, make decisions about closing areas? Um, for one thing, we have a we have a mission. Our mission is to provide, part of the mission, is to provide safe access to active volcanism and also protect the natural and cultural resources associated with volcanic landscapes. With that said, we work very closely with Ken. He mentioned, and, and the USGS, the Mine Volcano Observatory Scientist, um, he mentioned calling Rhonda, um, you know, when the eruption happened. But prior to that, we were looped in with conversations with USGS. He was, they were advising us on the situation. Um, our chief ranger was attending some of the civil defense meetings, etc. So when the earthquakes really started an uptick in October, it was like, let's close the summit now and Mauna Loa Road because something happens. That's a remote, high elevation, backcountry area. And if we had to evacuate or rescue people who were stranded or at threat, that would have been a very difficult movement to, to pull off. And thank goodness we had. That eruption happened on a Sunday night at 11.28 p.m. when most of the world was asleep. And it happened right there at the summit crater of Rubo Aveo Vale. So that, you know, those, those steps lead up to it. It's a really close working relationship with USGS, HBO. And also, what can we keep open? 
and trying to think, you know, people are going to now start flocking to the park. Where can we show them this eruption from a safe distance? And uh, speaking of the exceptional view that the park provided, um, Janice uh, Way, uh, what an incredible photographer she is. She She's sure been is. posting amazing uh, photographs in social media. Um, I, I, I make sure I check out Instagram every day, your Instagram, to see what she's captured and, and she shared. Um, and it seems that visual messaging and the sharing of those visual messages have really taken off in recent years thanks to things like Instagram. So in your time at the park, how has the way you've communicated with the public changed and does social like Instagram play a greater role? Social definitely plays a huge role now. Um, DOI was one of, it took a long time for them to even approve social media for federal agencies. It wasn't until 2012 that the park had even a Facebook page. And um, that was one of my first jobs, is to initiate those social media accounts for the park. Social media is important, but the number one place to get information, and the first thing that we do, like, I write a press release, it gets approved from on high, and, you know, it's whether whether it's National Park Week or whether it's a Mauna erupting, it gets approved and then the first place it goes is the park website because it has to have a presence on the web. Social media is great, but social media should be your sandwich board pointing back to your official website. Um, and that's where we tell people to go. If you're coming to the park, make the park website your first stop. Um, and then we send it out to uh, media and then it goes out on social. So there is an order of events that happen. But social is very important. Um, during an eruption, there's only really two of us or three of us in the park that are managing that social media account. And it's flooded when there's a big eruption like this. And it's, it's impossible to keep up with all of the comments. But it does play a huge role. And we're so fortunate to have somebody like Janice who helps us convey these stories in incredible imagery in almost no time. Philip, uh, during the 2018 eruption, a Kaika Marzo made you synonymous with the word Akamai. And you were successful in translating the facts and charts coming out of USGS into understandable language, both at the hub in Pahoa and online with Hawaii Tracker. With the 22 eruption and with other Kilauea activity, you've done more of the same, educating people on what's what with our volcanoes. Do you think the island is getting smarter when it comes to volcanoes, and is USGS in your eyes, putting out more or better data? And what do you think can be done to improve the flow of science and data into our communities? There's a lot of questions here. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's like a final answer. In essay form, no more than a half page. <laughs> well, for the first thing I'll address is, is the USGS data. It's been awesome. Um, USGS has actually put up, I think there's been more to this in the future, but then, the social media presence from USGS has also increased significantly in the past many years. Uh, the challenge really is that people are moving to the island who haven't had exposure to the situations we have. They don't know which website to look for, what is the park, or USGS. They may only look at Instagram and not follow the link to the group. So we just try to re re the message, try to clarify it, hold space for discussion to happen. Questions come in, people are asked in my particular situation, how does this affect me personally or I live in this particular location, this address. So we're just trying to really expand upon what all this question actually is, clarify, provide context and historical information, things that these other guys may not have time because as opposed to you hearing, they have many other things as well. So that's 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 really the first part of it. Uh, you may have to ask me any questions again as well. So, so is, is there anything on a wish list? Is there additional data or insight you wish? Uh, the agencies provided, or is there any unmet need from the community with information that they're seeking when there is an eruption? I think 2022 was a lot better than we saw in 2018, and I think partly it was the scale of the eruption, right? The, the area is impacted as well. In 2018, it was much different. There were, all Puno was affected as well as a whole summit volcano community as well. So there was quite a lot of area that had to be addressed, not as many staff, right? Uh, since 2019, all the, the response planning has evolved as well. So I really feel like 2022 was, was quite a step forward. There's always more room to go and improve. I think we probably didn't reach as many people as we would have hoped. If we were to judge, for example, some operations for Ocean View, not everyone actually got that message ahead of time. 
so we can probably improve upon that. And I think we've taken a great step forward having that eruption and having that actually impact the structure that much and give us all an example of how we're going forward and improve the future. Great, thank you. Uh, Dane, uh, so during the 2018 eruption, uh, Akaika's live streams, as well as live streams from others, from inside Leilani Estates really captured people's attention on Hawaii Tracker. And during that eruption, you also created and shared very detailed lava inundation maps at a time somewhere critical that the government wasn't doing the same or as quickly. Since that eruption and before last year's eruption, do you think the perception of Hawaii Tracker changed within the community? And do you think it's also changed um, with other government agencies, including some at this table? Yeah, I'd like to go through there. Uh, first, I'd like to thank, uh, start out with my first time being able to talk, but I'd like to thank Big Island Press Club and everybody that came out today. I'd um, like to thank two pineapples in the back for being able to live stream this for us. Appreciate it, everybody. Um, as for 2018, try and start there. The It was an entirely different experience compared to this eruption. It's a, it's a different sport to the, when it was in neighborhoods and things like that. Um, it was so fast. and. One of the things that happened was that the accounting of homes lost, the figuring out of when a home was lost, got off almost immediately. Um, the, my parents here, their rental home was the second home that was lost, and they contacted civil defense and asked them, like, you know, what, what's the status of the other house that's on the property? Oh, it's gone too. It's like, well, no, it's not. I can see the, the footage from the helicopter that it's still there. If you're getting lost at number two, we're going to have a problem here. I can see that. So we got up in the homestead, fallen, and then we got up to where I knew that it was so far off that it was the night and day, where they're saying 40 houses lost. I'm like, there's 40 houses lost in the street right now, not 40 houses lost total, right? So I went and grabbed TMK data, grabbed the USGS. At that time, they were um, working with the University of Hawaii, who was putting out the GIS layers of the lava flows in daily updates, so it was really good data, um, and a maintained data. So we overlaid all that and started just, you know, what, what houses are within the lava zones, right? And then anything that's on the border, we'll send people there to check it. You know, we'll send somebody on the ground to that address and tell me if the home's lost or not, right? What's the status? So when we published that, it went from, uh, I think like 200, we said 200 homes were lost, and civil defense was like maybe at like 70 or something like that. But this mattered in the, in the big scheme of things, too, because people couldn't begin to uh, file their insurance claims unless the home was officially you know, turned, deemed to be destroyed. Not only that, we couldn't go and apply for FEMA individual assistance to try and get the people the help that they needed, because they, their uh, criteria specifically sedated that you had to have this many homes lost. Well, if we're not able to count the homes lost, we're in trouble. So what ended up happening is EMA and uh, the DODs wrote a report for FEMA to do the individual assistance, and they just copied and pasted our map with no attribution, citation, anything. They just stole it, basically. And they're like, all right, guys, yeah, this is our work now. And it was page two of their application. And so it was like, all right, well, at least it's getting used, right? So we earned a lot of trust during that whole thing, and that's really what we've been trying to maintain and trying to extend, right? Because we earned trust with the Puna community and some of the volcano community, but mostly Puna, because that's where we were focused in 2018. We go to Ocean View during like the first uh, series of meetings on Mauna Loa, and we're starting to meet a lot of people that have never heard of us before, right? It's like okay, so we have work to do here, right? And we gotta, we, we don't have the impact immediately by just you know talking as we did on Puna. All right, that's fine. So we spent a lot of time trying to extend that trust um, to the rest of the island. So a lot of different events going all over just to do this type of thing. I do think that um, I mean I hope it has. That's really what we're just trying to maintain that, right? Um, in terms of the government, that's where I think the big progress has been made. We realized in 2018 that you're not going to be able to, no matter what you're able to do, or how capable you are, you're not going to be able to integrate into this system if you don't have these network connections established well before. You're not going to be able to show up and be like, hey guys, I can do this for you. And they're like, all right, come in the door and you know take the thing. It's not going to be like that at all. So. We spend a lot of time trying to build the relationships with USGS, trying to build the relationships with civil defense, which is an interesting thing because we were at odds in 2018, right? We're, we're, we're saying civil defense is wrong, they're saying we're wrong on things, right? So it's like we've got we to gotta come a long ways from that. And that's what 2022 was represented, is that that bridge, um, to me at least, 
And I think 2022 was a great eruption for us to have. It was a late night eruption. Late night eruption. I mean, it gave you everything that you would like not want to see, but then it was like in the very nice area that it ended up going into. <laughs> right? It gave you the night eruption on a Sunday. The earthquakes didn't even ramp up that. Like, we had like an hour where the earthquake ramp up and then boom, we're going. And that whole thing, it's like people are scared, right? We got to see that the south side of Kona, the roads just instantly jammed up, gas stations were getting pounded on, and it's like, okay, we didn't even ever have an evacuation order. Right? This is just people's own, okay, so got to take that into account for the next time. And I think a lot of people got experience being able to see it from the lava, from the caldera, from Kona, right? A lot of people got scared on that. It's like, next time, you already have experience that. I'm like, this is, the whole island got one under their belt on this. And that, you could run as many simulations, dry runs, and things like that as you want. It's not going to kind of count up to the real thing. And that's where I'm, like, I'm really... Like, not proud, but like I, I really have a lot of respect for the, everybody that came together on this one, and it, it, it showed a lot of progress. Um, um, sad that Tomich isn't here. Um, back in the 2018 eruption, um, well, every year the, the Big Island Press Club gives out an award and a dishonor. Uh, it gives out a torch of light award to a person or a group that's really shining light on a public issue or, or creating uh, openness and, and access into issues that are all important to us. But the Press Club also gives an annual dishonor called the Lava Tube Award. And in 2018, uh, the Press Club actually awarded that dishonor to civil defense uh, for uh, the 2018 eruption award. And when I had reached out to Tom Mitch to come and speak to this panel, he said he would definitely be here because he doesn't want to get another lava to him. <laughs> but uh, even though he's not here, I hope he's watching at home. Um, but I, I think, uh, and I, I, I'm sure I speak on behalf of many people here, that uh, it, it's clear that lessons were learned in the 2018 eruption. And, and I think the messaging, um, the community meetings, uh, and the outreach, and then the partnership with other groups like Hawaii Tracker, um, and, and other organizations on the island uh, were greatly improved, and I think uh, the flow of information before, during, and after the eruption uh, was improved because of Tomage's and civil defense's efforts. I, I did want to get that out there. Uh, so, no Tomage, no Lava Tube dishonor for you today. <laughs> did USGS win the Torch of Light in 2014 for the eruption? Is that right? I just wanted to shout them out. I'm not sure. But yes. 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 So um, I just want to say, as somebody who spent a fair amount of their career studying the origins of lava tubes, I find this offensive. <laughs> <laughs> That's the intent. <laughs> well, lava tubes are a cool thing. You know? It wasn't even as a derogatory term. Well, it's not cool when you want to put someone in one. <laughs> well, I've probably been closer into them than anybody else in the room. <laughs> So, I, I'm, I'm sure we have lots of uh, questions around the room. Before I go around the room asking questions, uh, a final question that I'd like to ask for the panel is, what, what was life like in those first seconds of the eruption? Like, how did you find out it was erupting? Were you staring at seismographs or webcams, or did you just get a call or a text in the middle of the night? How, how did you learn of the actual eruption was happening? And we'll start with Ken. Well, before we go there, I, I, I want to give a shout out to Phil and Dane in particular and just follow up a little bit because one of the things that Talmadge and I were talking about was how do we deal with social media? Like, you know, when we first started meeting in the winter of 2021, that was an issue because we knew that social media hadn't necessarily followed the messaging and the messaging hadn't been clear during 2018 and it was something we needed to figure out and get right. And it's not something that any government agency, we can do some social media, like I think Jessica does it as well as any government agency does, but trying to get out some of the warnings and stuff is much more difficult. And uh, Philip and Dane came up to me at a revitalized Puna meeting, and we just started chatting. I've known Philip for, I don't know, 15 years or something like that, 20 years? Or 
long time, anyways. So, but it was still being kind of an awkward position. I've inherited this position, and there's people that feel, you know, people start feeling attachment to their data, and to me, it's like, our job is to get information to the public and make sure that the public get it as well as possible and as correctly as possible. So we, when Philip and Dane started um, coming to and live streaming the meetings, it was great because we were reaching more people than we normally would. And so we had a little bit, I think that three month period allowed us to work together more and develop a relationship so when the eruption actually happened, we have this relationship. And I'll tell you, the one thing that I know from working out here since the 80s, you know, and with Harry Kim, is it's all about relationships, relationships, relationships. Every time somebody changes in a place, you've got to build that relationship from the ground up back again until they, there's that trust between people, and then everything rolls from there. So we were lucky enough to actually be able to work in this and, and develop a relationship with with Philip and, and Dana, and it, it was great, you know, and I, I must say this, that the interviews we did during the eruption, the most fun ones were the ones with Philip and Dane because they were more relaxed, and there was a, we knew we were getting to the local community, and people were asking questions, so those were the best, I think, of the, our ability to communicate, otherwise, it kind of felt like a lot of times I was talking to people, but, you know, Talmadge and I would stand in the room, looking at a little portable laptop screen with a bunch of names on it. <laughs> and you're just sort of doing the message and answering questions, but you don't feel that personal connection. So uh, those interviews were great. I just want to really give a shout out to those two guys and you know how they worked this and that, you know how we worked as a team on this eruption. It really worked out well, and we got to a lot of people we wouldn't have normally gotten to. So first, first moments of the eruption. But First awesome. moments of the eruption. I'm trying to avoid that question in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> Let me tell you about <laughs> this other stuff. Um, <laughs> so I actually decided at that point, my wife and I decided that we needed a break uh, because we've been going nonstop since the beginning of August when we had a seismic crisis in Samoa and a potential eruption in American Samoa. And so we had just hammered on that one for two months, getting the network set up down there. And then right as that one was calming down, Mauna Loa ramped up. And so the observatory was really kind of, we were all tired, I think, at that point, because we've been watching everything on a 24-7 basis for a long time. So my wife's cousin actually got us a room over at the... Uh, Marion like a law. <laughs> and he had some extra points or something, so he got us a room, so we were there the first night, you know, so <laughs> went to sleep, <laughs> got a phone call at like 11 o'clock at night going, seismicity is crazy, what should we do? <laughs> you know, kind of the seismologists were sure that this was the, the start of an eruption, and they were ex exactly correct. Uh, tilt meter was going crazy too, and so, you know, <clears throat> packed up, <laughs> all the stuff out of the room, threw it in the car, and was on com conference calls all the way through the saddle, watching the glow of the eruption of oh, the summit of Mauna Loa from the Waikoloa, and uh, I think I got back over here about two in the morning or something like that, but it was a really interesting way to start into an eruption anyways. But, uh, you know, and, and then the real thing, both Talmadge and I had felt like Mauna Loa is so potentially dangerous to people, right? It's the one kind of eruption that can catch people by surprise. Like, the Leilani Estates eruption took five days, really, to ramp up to anything, and then really took another two or three weeks before it really got going. Mauna Loa, like 1950, in three hours, basically, was over. What had happened was it had gone down, cleared out through populated areas and stuff, was in the ocean, and it was really, let's say, 24 hours. There were three streams of lava into the ocean in there. So that is so much faster. And, and we've been dealing with these things, and I've been trying to work this through with our whole crew because we haven't been used to this over the last 35 years or so, 40 years with Puuo. Uh, we haven't had to do these hair trigger split second eruption startups. And Kilauea has been actually training us with the summit eruptions because they're doing the same thing. They give us about an hour of warning 
and then boom, they're on us. And so we've been really working hard to be able to detect those things and also to detect the times when the volcano's in a state of unrest that it's likely to happen. So anyway, so yeah, I was not expecting that night for Mauna Loa to erupt. I was just like every other person on the island. We knew it's a possibility, but we didn't know exactly when or where. Je Jessica, we'll, we'll come down the table. Mine's not nearly. <laughs> and it's kind of embarrassing because I didn't know about it right away, but I had to wake up to pee at one in the morning and I grabbed my phone as one does just to take a look. In Janice Way, our volunteer photographer, there was about 4,000 text messages from her and all the caps and photos and like freaking out. Like, I'm getting in the car, meet me somewhere. And I just remember, I was like, oh my God, it's really happening. Um, when I first got hired at the park back in 2011, um, Dr. Jim Kawahikawa was the chief scientist then. And during my get to meet everybody tour, um, he's like, oh, Mauna Loa is going to erupt in your lifetime. And I was like, okay, sure he is. Okay. And that's when, as soon as I got off the phone with Janice and a couple other people I had to talk to, I was like, Jim was right! And it was immediate coffee and just gearing up for the day. I think we did our first press conference at like 6 a.m. or 4 a.m. or something. Civil Defense and USGS were like, let's do it. We were all up. <laughs> <laughs> I forget, what, I think, what was our first live stream then? Yeah. Was, was it, we live streamed that? Yeah, yeah. So, so Dan, Dan and I, we, we kind of take shifts. Dan is the night, night shift guy. So Dan was the one pinging me with, with text messages and trying to reach me in any way. And I put my kids to bed and I was, you know, I, I, I saw messages and I was like, okay, it's, it's going to happen, but I'm take a minute. Because we know once these things start, they go for a while, I got to kind of pace myself. So I, <laughs> early. <laughs> earlier. So, yeah, so. Uh, uh, they alerted me. He had already been posting uh, on the white tracker from the hour before when the storm began, the quarter action began. He had already posted, tracking that as well. Uh, and then the first person was out there. And we, we have kind of two, two goals we're trying to accomplish at that point. And one is to kind of be live immediately so that people have somewhere to go to get information that we do know. The other part of it is trying to analyze what's actually happening and listen to the SGS for their statements to then be able to. To, to state those as well. So we kind of split up right away and kind of divide those, those duties. We went online to make sure it was, we had a presence online immediately right away. And I followed it a little bit afterwards with kind of collecting more information that I, was, that I was able to share. So that was, that's how we operate. I, I touched on it briefly. I, I was on vacation after a number of very busy weeks and snuck out to the West Coast and was in Santa Clara, I'd gone to the 49ers game on Sunday, and it was 1 o'clock in the morning California time, so about 11 o'clock, and my wife woke me up. Um, my wife has followed these things closely for years. Um, her mom, uh, Terry Murphy, retired as the chief dispatch at the National Park. My wife lived in Ranger Spokers when she was in high school, and it's something that's always been a focus for her, so when there's any activity, she's watched, she's watching the USGS site and seeing the activity, she woke me up at 1 o'clock, and shortly after 1 o'clock, and said it's erupting. Um, I immediately was on the phone with Civil Defense, uh, trying to call my staff to get them into place. Uh, I have some ability to, to push some audio remotely, um, so we got early messages from Civil Defense up uh, online. We got some social media up as well, we saw what you guys were doing as well, um, and trying to mobilize our staff. And you guys, I think that press conference, if I'm not mistaken, it was like 4.30 in the morning. It was pretty early. I was watching that. Um, and as my wife was booking flights uh, for me to fly back um, from San Francisco at about 8 that morning or 9 that morning. Um, but yeah, if, you know, and, and the first thing that crossed my mind is, sure, the one time I'm out of town this is going to happen in the middle of We've been watching it, it looked like things were moving in that direction, but didn't expect it was going to be that night. So um, it, it kicked off a, a very, very long day, but to your point, it was absolutely spectacular and, and um, fortunately, you know, no significant loss of no property damage. Um, hopefully a lot learned uh, as well. Um, and to the points earlier too, I, I think much greater communication. Uh, Dane and Philip filled a gap to my point earlier about in the absence of good information. Other information will fill that gap, and I think they provided great information. 
Um, but I do think that, that our officials have learned from that. It's something that I've been arguing for a long time. And I'm like, hey, we need an update. And they're like, well, we don't have anything new to say. And I said, sometimes it's okay to say, this is what we know at this time, and we don't have anything new since the last update, but running the same report that we've been running from six in the morning till six at night, um, leads people to believe that, that we're not on the details that we need to be. So, and, and I think it's also very easy when you're managing, and, and I have a lot of respect for, for our emergency managers, um, that they've got a lot on their plate, but when you're in the EOC, when you're in the emergency operating center, you see what you see, and you have all these resources around you, but what you don't see necessarily is what the public sees and hears. Um, and they're clamoring for more information, and as I said, in the absence of that, um, they're going to find it somewhere, and they may not find the message that you want them to hear, which creates bigger problems when you're trying to manage the situation. So certainly, I, I think you guys have done a wonderful job in, in filling in that void, and, and I think that uh, we learned a lot between those two eruptions, for sure. So the start of the eruption, yeah, I was uh, just on the computer that night and uh, just happened to check on the, I think somebody might even message me, like, oh, there was a weird earthquake. So check it out, and it was like 1045, you know, and it's like, oh, there are some weird earthquakes. The weird thing was, I remember I checked tilt, and I don't know if it was online publicly that night, because I was like, oh, I don't have any tilt. Oh, man, the tilt's flat, line, or something like that. So I was just watching seismic, and I'm like, man, this is... It, it, it looked like something's definitely happening, right? And I was like writing up the message, but I'm like sitting on it for a while too. Like, do I post this or not? Do I call and wake people up or not, right? On this one, because it's like, I'm gonna look really dumb if this thing is just like a random off earthquake type of thing and in the beginning, and I'm starting calling and waking everybody up. So it's like, all right, just waited, waited, put out the thing like, oh, God, we're earthquakes. And watching the cams uh, just to see what happens. And then I remember it wasn't the thermal camera, it was the, uh, one of the, the model of some of the cameras just up there, it just got an orange hue to it. It just got an orange hue, and I'm like, all right, I have thousands of these images from this camera recorded and stored. It has never gone orange like this before. It, something's up up there, so I was like, all right, I'm the next one, the thermal should update in like two minutes, and I'm going to type out the message and just wait to get into it. Take the thing, and sure enough, that updates, and all right, we're going. And now it's like, all right, who do I call? Like, <laughs> you know, we got to get up, and then it's. Uh, launch the live stream immediately, right? And just get up there and start talking. And it's, Bill's got to uh, figure out, you know, something actually intelligent to say about the thing. And, you know, with the data and whatever. So I'm like, all right, I'll buy you an hour or two. And, and I remember I looked down only at one point. There's like just a bunch of questions flying through and stuff like that. And I looked down at one point. It was stream on multiple services. So it's hard to know, like, exactly what your view count is. And I checked a few of them. and was like, I think I got, like, 7,000 live views or something at this point. I was like, all right, so this is the biggest stream we've ever done, and I have like four photos to share <laughs> and some earthquake maps, and it's just, you know, talking just, you know, what we've talked about at the other things. Like, it's not out of the summit yet, it's not out of the summit. The funny thing was is I didn't know that we were using different summit definitions. He was, uh, the USGS was using like a greater caldera, which was a more, a smaller area than I was just like, ah, it's just 12,000 feet. Anything above that summit, it's like, oh, well, that's kind of, Unprecise, but it was like, hey, it kind of worked, you know, type of thing, because we were just trying to figure out to keep the rules simple, right? For people, like, once it gets out of the summit and it picks a rift zone, it's picked the rift zone and it's not going to go back, type of thing. And we see people online saying, oh, it's across the summit, across the summit. It's like, all right, well, we're going to have to do some work on that, you know, like figuring out exactly what the lines are. And there was no communication on that, but I was like, it was just going. And then we got a call from Taika Marzo at like three in the morning or four. And he's like, the Mitch Roth, the mayor wants to go on live, and uh, Ken Han wants to come on too. And it's like, all right, well, let go. Um, okay, we didn't have, we had no plans to do this before. Like when we were doing all those things and working, you know, feeling each other out and getting to know each other, it was not a plan. Like, all right, so when the model goes, we'll, we'll do this. It was just all ad hoc. It was all ad hoc on the fly. So I think as soon as the press conference ended, uh, you hopped on our screen. And we were talking, you know, about it. And I think right as that was going, it was about the time that it transitioned into the rift zone. And we were able to do that as well. And we talked about that a little bit. So it was, you know, a really interesting night, that whole thing. You know. Excellent. Uh, are there questions in the room? I'll walk around with the mic. Does anyone have a question? Well, I walk back there. Speaking of some unrest, um, Ken, at Mount Aloha, just Thursday night, there was some interesting 
seismic activity there. Could you elaborate on what, what that all was? That'll be yep. great with. Um, that was a tectonic set of earthquakes on the Kawiki Fault, which is the south flank of Mauna Loa. So it's a stress readjustment. Okay. Hi, thank you. Uh, so what is, who puts the tow meter up there? And is it something that you have to go and check or monitor? Or how does it work? Well. Great question. Uh, we have a crew of field engineers that put our instruments up with the permission from the Park Service, right? Because we work as partners, we're part of the same Department of Interior Agency, but you can't just go putting things around in the National Park. <laughs> so we work together to build a network that will give us the information we need. And so the tilt meter, we actually had to drill a hole in the ground about 10 feet deep because up at the surface, the rocks will kind of jostle around. So you want to get it down deeper in the ground. So, so we put it up there, and then that data is telemetered by radio. And luckily, before the 2018 eruption, actually, when we did it, used to be everything went back to the old HBO building, kind of like spokes on a wheel. Now we have kind of think of the Olympic rings. Each of the volcanoes and areas has a ring that the data kind of runs around from radio to radio. And those rings cross at certain places, so it can jump rings in two to four to six places, depending on the ring. So that means we can tap into our data anywhere on the island and run it. And that's what happened in 2018. The building got destroyed, so HBO set up on the UH Hilo campus. If it would have been the way it was in 2012 and 2018, everything would have shut down. So so we have ways to get into the data and let it run around all over the place. And so so we're, we're monitoring the top of the volcano all the time. We did lose a few instruments that we had down on the floor of Mapua Vale Vale. Um, <laughs> that webcam that you guys saw the orange on at first, it's one of them. <laughs> um, I want to thank everyone for being here, and I want to thank you for everything you did during the eruption and everything you've been doing to improve communication since uh, 2018. So I'm wondering, since this thing went pretty well, unless you were very scared in Kona and evacuated and gotten on to get gas, what's going to happen next time it's new and improved? I can tell you a couple of things that we did during this eruption, and one of the biggest advances we made was in the mapping and getting the mapping out in real time. We didn't get that going until about three days into the eruption, but we had people all over the country kind of working on that, through us, through uh, County Civil Defense, through IEMA, through FEMA, and we actually had a place where the guys out in the field were entering stuff, they actually got an app on their phone, we're entering data points on their phone and was flying straight into the map on civil defense and going onto the public website and then out to everybody else. So, so letting people know where the lava is, we've developed a, during this eruption, we've developed a whole new way to do that. And the messaging, <laughs> that we need to be more on it on our messaging in a situation like a summit eruption to just keep saying, you know, there's still no sign. Yes, it's moved to the south, but that does not mean it's moved into the southwest trip zone. Right. And it was one of the messages we actually had out before the eruption, that the 1984 eruption had faked to the south and then turned around and went to the northeast. And this did the exact same thing. It did exactly what 1984 did, had faked to the south, moved to the northeast. So. Yeah, I wanted to add uh, one other thing, too. We were working on this prior to it. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't move particularly fast, but... Uh, we filed for what's called the White Area Waiver for a booster for a station uh, at South Point. Uh, one of the challenges, uh, one of the big concerns that's been discussed a lot over the years, uh, not only do you have people that are built up close to the rift zone in, in the southwest of, of Mauna Loa, um, but a significant lack of communication, significant lack of infrastructure, bandwidth is poor, um, almost no radio coverage out there. Uh, we filed with the FCC and were approved for a white area waiver to put a translator out there. Uh, our hope is that will actually be online by this summer. Uh, we're still waiting for a few things to come through, but we'll have some additional communication out there. And that's been one of the big issues, aside from the messaging, is even if you have the messaging in order, how do you get that out to people that have little access to bandwidth and no access to um, 
to uh, over the air radio or television in some cases. I'm going to try not to take too long on the, uh, to answer that one because i got a few things to say on that. Um, for the next one, there's a lot of things that are changing, right? And we're going to have to accommodate those things and work around them. The first one is easy to work around. It's Starlink. We're going to be able to blanket, or it's already blanketed, the entire island, high-speed internet, reliable options, all kinds of stuff, plug-and-play, easy, right? This is just going to be a net win for everything involving response, communication, all of it. The next one is more interesting and uh, has a double-sided effect to it, and that's the AI that we're seeing right now. The GPT and all this, it's not just GPT. A lot of people have disattributed to GPT, but there is a swarm of these things coming. These language models that are, I mean, we, Bill and I we were from computer science. We, when we were in there, the AI was thought of as this fantasy, you're wasting your time with uh, uh, artificial general intelligence, you know, it's not going to happen, Turing problems too hard, you know, all this type of stuff. All of those walls have fallen. All of those walls have fallen. And they have fallen in three months, including walls that I didn't even think about until we got to it, like taking a open source AI and cloning GPT, having AI clone AI, and then using that as a feedback loop to train your thing, extremely low cost. I can now do have way too much power as an attacker on a network. And it's, it, it, from a misinformation standpoint, it is going to be shattering. It is going to be shattering. The, 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 the amount of bots that are online, I don't think a lot of people realize. Across social media, you can't get real you know, numbers on it, so this is my best window of trying to figure it out. The, between all the social media accounts, say the top 10, top 20, They'll remove the population of the Earth to twice the population of the Earth every six months and just fake accounts and bots. You arm those bots with AI, and now you can't tell them apart. And this is going to be, and even if it, like the dangers I'm talking about, right? It's gonna, the other side of that sword is the beneficial side, right? This thing is going to blow out something like the Industrial Revolution, and it's going to do it in an extremely short amount of time. All of these things, like the development of technology, right? Things that like Moore's Law, all of these fundamental concepts, they are, this AI is not bound by that. You can have a 10x increase in a day, and it's almost expected that that happens. It's a technological explosion that we're facing, and we're gonna have to not just start now, and it's just using the thing to get antibodies, get a tolerance to it, see how it does, try and figure out the patterns to it, because it is pattern-based. It's not real intelligence. It's still giving you fragments that are organized in the intelligent fashion of a human. It's, but it's enough. I don't need a general intelligence to make a weapon, right? I need what it is right now, what, it, what AI is right now, and then just to remove something like the, the, the message block that tells it to you know contain yourself and don't be crazy. You just take all those rules, delete them. All right, now what? Now I'm just training AI with AI. This is bad. Like, this is crazy all of a sudden. So, yeah, that's my thing. I just wanted to talk about that for a minute because I've spent the last three months developing basically a training program for developing people like Phil and I to try and tackle the online sphere and this, this, this new thing that we're going into by training people. These, the, all the companies uh, will talk about, oh, we're going to have AI solutions to detect AI. It's not going to work. People talk, and the AI developers themselves, if you listen to them talk, they say, oh, we just need legislation. That's funny. I watched a TikTok hearing the other day, and one congressman asked the CEO of TikTok if TikTok uses Wi-Fi. It's like, that's the caliber of people that you're talking about here. They don't understand the basics of anything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for scaring us. Uh, <laughs> I have another scary question. Uh, what if all the lie erupts? I seem to remember that if it does erupt, it's going to come down really fast. But could you say a little about what that scenario might look like? Well, if you've been over in Kona at rush hour. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, it's another situation kind of like the southwest rip zone of Mauna Loa. There's more people, but you know, people just need to know that the lava flow will come down. 
we will be able to tell them where it's coming down, when it's coming down, right? And they need to get out of the way, you know? And the thing is about lava is you can't save your house. You know, you, you, you just need to make sure that you get your most valuable possessions and your family and loved ones and whatever out of the way of the lava flows, right? You're right, uh, there are definitely some eruptions of walleye. They carried up pieces from maybe 20 miles down inside the earth that are this big. And so we can take the weight of those rocks that are coming up and figure out how long that they would take for them to settle, how, what the settling velocity was if you just threw them into a, a, a swimming pool full of the lava, right? They would settle to the bottom. We know that the lava coming up had to be moving at at least that velocity, so we get some indications that the uh, lava could be coming from that deeper magma chamber up to the surface within about eight hours, and then beyond the surface. And those magma chambers are deep enough that we don't see a lot of them until they start really getting active. And having never had one instrumented, the last time that we think there was something was 1929 on Hawaii. There was a big magnitude 6.8 earthquake there, and a bunch of smaller earthquakes. We think that was something going on down in the deeper magma chamber. But so we're not sure exactly what kind of warning. That's exactly what we were dealing with in American Samoa, where they were having like five different earthquakes a day. Um, and at about the same place, and the same kind of thing brought up chunks of the lower. So, so th those are concerning, but I think we have good enough communication working with everyone to make sure when the, the lava flow starts on its way down, it's not going to necessarily make it into the populated areas right away. Right? It's going to take a little while. Although the 1800-1801 lava flow that the airport is built on over there, right? So that's the one observed lava flow on Walleye, is that one, the Mamea was there, the fish ponds and stuff, all that lava was going in there. That took place below, the vent was below the upper highway, and uh, maybe two miles or so above the lower highway. So they could get to places, but when you're talking about Kona or Kailua proper, the vents are going to be much higher, so it's going to take a little while for the lava to get down there. So, but it is definitely something we're concerned about. We did have somebody go over after the Mauna Loa eruption and had a schedule during our Volcano Awareness Month at talk in Kona, and I think only three people showed up. So it is one of these things, like Philip was talking about, a lot of people have moved in, aren't really aware that they're living on a volcano, and so how do we message them and keep them aware without trying to make them overly alarmed? The three people that showed up were tourists. <laughs> so, um, speaking of, of uh, narratives and, and misinformation and, and losing the story, uh, back during the winter of 2122, uh, the National Weather Service in Honolulu had issued a blizzard warning for the summits of Mount Loa and Mauna Kea. And mainland media jumped on that and said, all of Hawaii is suffering from a freak blizzard. This is climate change in action. And there was a huge uptick in cancellations of tourist travel, not only to the Big Island, but throughout the state. And due to the economic hit of the blizzard warning, the National Weather Service actually made the decision to no longer issue blizzard warnings for the Big Island summits. They'll issue winter storm warnings, but they've made a policy decision not to issue a blizzard warning because the handful of people that are up on the summits are aware of the weather and there's no need to um, uh, fuel uh, potential misinformation on the mainland. So with, with all that said, during the most recent eruption, I spoke to two uh, resort managers at Kohala Resorts and they also said that they experienced an uptick in cancellations during festive season because there was a misperception that Mauna Loa was threatening, or could be a threat, uh, to the to the Kohala coast and, and to the resort. So they actually saw um, a bit of a decline with uh, the early part of festive season um, travel. So I, I know your first <coughs> mission is protecting lives, um, but does is protecting revenue even on your on your vision? Um, are you concerned about that with messaging? And did you see that as an issue um, 
with the most recent eruption. And Jessica is finally shaking right around, so I'll have her answer that first. Um, for Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, I come from the visitor industry also. Um, I was PR at the Fairmont Orchid for a number of years, and then I went and um, handled the Big Island Visitors Bureau account as a PR person for a couple of years, too, before getting the best job in the world at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Um, it, we hear from Hawaii Tourism Authority if we're portraying stuff we really heard about in 2018. Um, especially, you know, when the summit was collapsing and the park closed for 134 days and we heard from all of the BMBs in Volcano Village who were just, I mean, up until the point where the earthquake started and everyone started to be quiet again, they're like, oh, okay, we get it now. But we are keenly aware of that. Um, on the top of every webpage at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park is, a, is an alert. Um, so if you're looking at trails or if you're looking at homepage or you're looking at calendar events, the top of that page is going to have whatever is closed at the time. And we've been very careful with our wording there, because if we say Mauna Loa closed, it seems people call the park and think the whole park is closed. The concierge at the hotels on the other side think the hotel is closed. That has a direct impact on business. And it's certainly not our job to make sure everybody is, you know, has heads and beds and they're counting revenue, but it is to be careful communicators so we don't portray a false impression that something is worse than it is. So, yes, we, we take that keenly into account, especially as being the most visited destination, oftentimes in the state, but definitely on the island. And how, how tricky of that is that messaging for the park? Because you, you often have Kilauea erupting, yes. uh, but you're still welcoming guests there. And I don't think anyone, or many people not familiar with the park or the island know just how a caldera eruption is and how can you really drive up and take a look at it and how is that safe, but something else on the island may not be safe. How, how do you convey that complex message out there? The park is enormous. We're over 355,000 acres now, now that with the uh, Pohui acquisition um, late last year. So there's always somewhere in the park, almost always you can go. Even in 2018, the Kuhuku unit in South, um, in the Ka'u district remained open. So we never fully closed the park. So we really try to convey what is open in the park, um, because there usually is somewhere people can go. And then, uh, Chris. Um, Refreshing your memory, in January of last year, uh, USGS had changed the status of the Kilauea volcano uh, in a situation that was never quite clarified by Amazon or Hyema or how, on how it happened. Uh, Amazon Alexa systems around the island issued a voice alert to their users on island, uh, island-wide saying that there was an orange volcano warning in effect. And it actually was pushed, pushed a couple of times. And it, and it was a false alarm. Um, but when it comes to automated or semi-automated alerts going out to our communities in emergency, um, can you describe how information comes through the process and through broadcast channels? And how is that changing over time? Um, so first, the, the issue that, that happened was an aviation warning uh, that was out of, out of Hawaii emergency managers um, range, and we're not, we're still trying to figure out exactly how Amazon picked that up that way, but it was basically an orange aviation warning due to uh, ash events basically at high altitude, um, but the abbreviated version of what went out made it sound like we were under an immediate threat, and for those that had an Amazon unit that was turned on for that, all of a sudden your Amazon, your, your Alexa speaker is blaring much like your cell phone would be during a WIA alert. Um, unfortunately, out of our jurisdiction, we tried to figure that out and exactly how that happened. We traced it back to being an aviation alert that wasn't properly tagged, I think, on their side. Um, on our side, uh, the EA, there's, there's two primary systems. There's an EAS system, emergency alert system, and WEO, wireless emergency alerts. The WEO ones are the ones that squawk really loud on your cell phone. The EAS alerts are the ones that you see and hear on radio and television that have the, the tone, the two-tone squawk at the front followed by the message. Um, there are at the state warning point at Diamond Head, um, at the county EOCs, and actually the county police departments have access to it too, although rarely used. They have the ability to trigger events. The events are coded with what's called a FIPS code, which is a geo code, basically says this alert is for this geographic area. 
They're coded within that little two-tone squawk that you hear. They're coded with what the alert is. So it, it, the equipment transcribes that code. So if it's a volcano alert, if it's a blizzard warning, if it's a flash flood warning, it carries that code in there. That's what also generates the crawl that you see on television. Um, and then there's generally an attached audio file that is um, either recorded in some cases or now also auto-generated with AI, um, which is a little bit scary. Uh, but there's a very strict protocol on, on how you have access to that. So going back to our discussion about the false missile issue earlier, the concern was, hey, was the system hacked? No, the system wasn't hacked. It was a procedural act, uh, access to that system that was misapplied, human error. Um, but yeah, there are concerns about making sure that it's, that it's valid. And I think that the, the biggest danger in all of these systems is we become very reliant upon them but all it takes is one major error like that for people to lose confidence in the system. And people are like, hey, I'm gonna go to somebody's Twitter feed to get better information than a certified, authenticated service. Um, when we had the missile issue, one of the questions that I was asked a lot was, hey, you're very well connected. How did you not know that this was fake? And I said, I, I raced to my studio, I got there. We are what's called an LP, a local primary and state emergency plan. I have a dedicated circuit between my facility and state civil defense. Uh, it's not subject to Chris Leonard's interpretation. If I get a verified, authenticated alert that says that we have a missile attack, um, it's supposed to go through that process where it's thoroughly vetted and thoroughly authenticated before it hits us. Um, it was, it, the, the process was correct, but the message was wrong. And they had somebody that made a mistake and several people that lost jobs over that. Um, but the biggest damage that was done on that day and the biggest concern going forward is that when people lose confidence in those systems that we hold true and expect to be valid, where do we go from there? And again, people start looking all over the place and with AI and all these other things coming out, um, you know, Dane's point is, is very significant. There are a lot of concerns, while there are great applications for all this new technology, the big question is how do you stay in front of that and ensure that the public still gets valid, accurate, verified information on a regular basis. And I think there are a lot of questions that remain to be asked. And technology is changing faster than the government can stay in front of it. And, and with this eruption, I believe Civil Defense pushed out um, an email and an Everbridge text alert just saying the eruption has started. But were there any other emergency signals activated for this alarm? There was no wireless emergency alert for for the start of the eruption, is that correct? Uh, no, we have that I'm aware of. I believe we did have an EAS alert. We did get an audio file pretty quickly from Civil Defense when they ramped up. So they, they do several things in, in Hawaii County. We have a pretty close working relationship. Uh, they do a lot via audio files. We, we try to encourage them to, um, to also use the EAS system, unlike our, our facilities where we ramp up staff-wise pretty quickly when there's an issue. Not everybody is fully staffed around the clock. It's tough to do that in this economy. Um, that the EAS system can push and access all of those stations on an automated basis without the stations being there. And, and that's based on this state plan that I referenced earlier. Um, the challenge with the EAS system is when they push an EAS message, it plays once. It doesn't repeat unless they push another message. So the difference is when we have an active alert here, uh, Town Mitch or his staff will record a message and say, hey, this is the 6 a.m. report. Please air this hourly and we're going to schedule that and it's going to play every single hour. An EAS message will push. It's active for whatever the declared duration is, but it does not automatically replay on its own. We have a friend that's uh, really involved with the Salvation Army and they do a lot of uh, emergency response when there are events. Um, how well is that part of the picture integrated into the information that's coming out so that people know where to go, where they can get food, where they can get shelter, and that type of stuff? Is that effective or is it needing work? Um, I think it can be effective, but each situation is a little bit different. You know, as we talked about, 2018, 19 was a lot different than this last eruption. Um, we have a lot of contact, so a lot of those agencies will reach out to us and say, hey, can you help with this? If it's a long, ongoing event, oftentimes that will also surface through civil defense, and they will message um, 
you know, if, if there are significant closures or shelter openings, they'll say, hey, all the following shelters are open. Here's where you have access to resources. Um, we get a lot of those direct from those agencies that come to us and say, hey, will you help support this? And as long as we can verify that, we do what we can to make sure that they get that information. But again, on the longer events, it's a little bit different. The, the Leilani eruption was a real challenge on a lot of different levels. One, there were times where um, officials weren't as responsive, but the other issue that we had in the Leilani eruption, which is a very long eruption, uh, to Jessica's point earlier about relationships, we have great relationships, so I can get on the phone and I can get a PIO in a department, but if you have an event that goes on for a month, those people are now cycling out. They're bringing in a public information officer from a department in Honolulu. They're bringing in staffers from you know the water department to answer the phones. Uh, and I was sharing earlier, I mean, I remember calling one night and they said, I, we had a question about an urgent situation. And they're like, oh, media requests need to talk to the PIO. And that's 9 o'clock on Friday night. PIO left at 5. She's not coming back till Monday. And trying to define the difference between emergency communications and 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 just writing a story sometimes is challenging in trying to define those lines. Um, and the relationships that we rely on, which are generally pretty good through most of the agencies in a small community like ours, um, the relationships become less valid when that person is now, after working two weeks straight with no sleep, is, um, is out and somebody from Honolulu or you know, a representative from FEMA comes in from out of state. And that's one of the things that I've been really focused on is trying to work with our emergency managers to say, the relationships are great, and we have some of the best relationships, I think, between media and emergency managers that exist in the state and many parts of the country, but we can't solely rely on the relationship because what happens if I'm not in my seat or you're not in your seat, and my staff and your staff still communicate without being able to say, hey, I can pick up the phone and call Chris. Um, can I just call his station and they know what to do because there's proper procedures in place, proper identification in place for that to happen. Because of all your hard work in recent months, um, we have go bags. You have go bags. Everybody on the west and the south has go bags. Where was Noah's go bag? Yeah, I mean, why were they? Why were they caught so off guard and lose all their uh, important data? Anybody know? I know they're not oh, here. Oh well. You can't have a go bag for the instruments they have up there. Understood. So they, they, we notified them right away that something was happening. They got their people out and what they needed to get out. And the problem was the electrical power got cut to their observatory. And so that, that was the real problem. They have big instruments that require all sorts of special cooling and stuff like that. And they don't run without power. So they were able to shut down their facility so nothing got damaged. So they got out okay, but there's only so much you can do. And they were able to move one of their instruments, the one that keeps track of CO2, they, or they got another one in and moved it over on Mauna Kea for part of the eruption, so to keep the data set going. Which the data set is going to be suspect, well you have a big volcano spewing CO2 into the air anyways. So, <laughs> so their big thing is trying to get power and a road back in now. Power is going to be more complicated than the road because as PGV found out that when you stick wooden poles into a hot lava flow, they tend to burn to a crisp pretty fast. And even putting the steel power poles in is difficult when the lava is still as hot as it is. So we're, we're just about out of time. Uh, to wrap up, I'd like to go through the panel and hear from each of you what, what was a big takeaway from this last eruption? What, what was something that worked out really well or didn't work out well? If you could do something all over again, what, what would it be? Uh, I'll start with Ken. What, what works really well or, or not that you'd want to change for uh, the inevitable next event? Well, I, I think, as we've been talking here, is everybody worked together as a team. And I think that whole, we're on an island, we're a team, we have something special that the rest of the country seems to be losing really fast, which is a sense of community and the sense that we're out here to help each other in a situation like this. So I'm really proud of everybody on the island and everybody who took part in this, that you know, we were able to respond to this and get people's attention. And, and, and just the way it unrolled rolled the whole thing, and the mayor was terrific, you know, talking about trying to get the message out, you know, and make sure that there isn't an economic impact. 
And it's actually Dane and Philip that sat and told him, you know, every eruption, people say you're going to make a viewing area. If you say that, you better follow through with it. And the mayor just took that glove that they threw down on the floor and picked it up, and 24 hours later, he had that viewing area through PTA. So many thanks to folks in the U.S. Army to, you know, that's a lot of red tape that was cut through in a very, very short amount of time. And there was all of a sudden a viewing area and it did, instead of an economic calamity, you had all these visitors coming up and seeing something the most spectacular thing they've seen in their life, along with tons of people that live here, right, coming up and being able to safely view it. And I'll tell you from seeing it from several different perspectives, unless you're helicoptered right to the vent, that view from the road was as good as it was going to get. I mean, it was a really amazing thing, and we had a stadium set up there. That said, if it would have happened on the south end of the island with one road, one narrow road out there, it would be very difficult to get people in to view because really what you're trying to do is get people out of that area, right? So we have to, you know, be aware that not everything translates from one eruption to another, right? So it, it is something I think that we have to really be aware of is how do we manage those kind of issues and, you know, the communications get much more difficult because we would have, probably we would have to split up, have people at the EOC here, have an EOC on the north side over in Kealakekua, have another EOC somewhere in Naalehu, you know, so that we would be split up all over the place and it would take, a, a lot of these problems get confounded because we do have to bring in people from elsewhere. The good news on Mauna Loa, like I said, it's all over in 24 to 48 hours, so <laughs> we can burn our staff out in 24 or 48 hours, so we've got enough people to cover it for that amount of time during the intense crisis part of it. So, um, I, I think the communication was significantly better as we've done. Collectively, we've all touched on. Um, I, I uh, echoed his point, Ken's point, that um, we have a great community and the relationships do drive a lot of this. But we were fortunate. The location was helpful in this. The time frame was helpful in this. If it, if it had been a Southwest Rift Zone issue, uh, this discussion today would probably be a little bit different. It'd probably be a lot different. Uh, and I think that's a concern. I think the length of time of, of events is something that we still need to continue to discuss, is how do you have this, continue, uh, this continuation of operations that is seamless, regardless of who the primary people are, because they cycle out as, as we put tremendous stress on the system from a staffing standpoint to, to meet the demand. I think that's going to be a huge factor. But I thought the improvement um, from the Leilani eruption to this one was significant and noticeable from a communication standpoint. I think that's a step in the right direction, but there's always room for continued improvement. Yeah, I'd agree that the common thread between 2018 and 2022 is really for our community. That's kind of why, why we're all on this path and are still here years later. It's our community. That's what's really special about this place. So that was really the, the, the take home message for me, like you know, how much we all wanted it, how much improved in that, in that delivery and response. There's still work to do. As Chris said, from the Southwest Rift, there have been a different discussion today. But fortunately, we can all learn from what we went through. We have a, a case study, and we can look at what actually happened, which is the best case scenario. So I think that's, that's the best situation. Um, the, the breaking wave of AI is something we have to deal with as a whole new threat the next time. So we're, we're trying to prepare ourselves for that now. Uh, on the ground response, we saw that there was a hub in Pahoa in 2018. We didn't have to activate any hubs on the ground in 2022, fortunately. But that's something we're still all working on uh, through back of Hawaii and trying to stand those up should that come to happen or when it comes to happen in the future. So that's still yet to be tested. Uh, but I think that's where we're, we're really looking to in the next few years. Um, I think one thing that we're really well is that the eruption started in the park and it was out of the park really quickly. <laughs> Your problem, no, I'm just kidding. Um, the one thing that I thought it, it still resonates is um, Katie Mulliken from USGS had galvanized this hui, this team of the public information officers from a multiple uh, from multiple agencies, and we had already started meeting virtually on Monday mornings right after the USGS meeting to talk about what are we going to do? Are we going to stand up a virtual JIC, a virtual joint information center? And that's exactly what ended up happening. 
daily briefings were held in that platform, and that took the load of the enormous media interest, that crushing wave, off of our shoulders. I would say 90%, tenfold, whatever you want to say. Um, that was super helpful because, you know, I could talk to a reporter and go, hey, if you want to follow this, you know, be on the call at 9 a.m. tomorrow, and that was tremendously helpful. I give a lot of credit to Katie and her team. Um, it wasn't, you know, we didn't get everybody brought in right away, but eventually all the PIOs who needed to have the seat at that table was something to report out and were part of that um, morning briefing. So excellent work there. Um, the thing I thought, and this is probably maybe, maybe surprising, we didn't really have a great story to share about Pele and her relationship to Mauna Loa eruptions in particular. And that question came up on one of um, the morning briefings, and we we're like, oh, I mean, we have a lot of knowledge about Mauna Loa with Pele and her relationship to Kilauea, Haleiwa'oma, and other eruptions in that area. But these questions came up from local media, local residents, etc., and we never really got a good um, answer or response. So I think that the next time we would want to assign a cultural liaison, whether that person is somebody from the Edith Kanaka Oli Foundation or HTA, somebody who's paid, not just, hey, can you come in and you know give us your manao, mahalo, but a paid person to really answer those questions because these are very cultural, significant events for Hawaiian people. We should be able to articulate that in our communications as well as the science. Yeah, um, I think really I just like to thank like all the people in Tracker because like Bill and I are up here, but Tracker is now like 117,000 people. We have dozens of professional photographers, videographers. We had um, during the Mauna Loa eruption, we were thankful to have Kit Tincher show up. And he did mapping efforts on Mauna Loa um, for USGS, I believe, and with or at least with, and he was uh, making our maps for us. And then we were having issues with being able to like, get the uh, the raw GIS from USGS, like we couldn't, we couldn't get it to basically work and uh, we just didn't have access. And civil, uh, civil defense was able to do it because, you know, USGS, but they're sharing it with civil defense. Civil defense says, yeah, we can share the link. And then they give it to us so that we can give it back to uh, our map maker and that makes his life a lot easier type of thing. So it's like this collaborative effort that really the thing that, you know, is that makes a white tracker a white tracker, right? I don't go out and take photos and stuff like that because there's going to be 20 people that submit better photos than I'll ever take. Think, uh, so, really like to thank all those guys because that's what our biggest success was in that whole thing is just being able to the network itself and being able to maintain it. And the thing is, is like as soon as you start blowing up, everything becomes harder. Like that first day, I think we gained something like 7,000 new users. We bet new users because I don't like bots. I don't like you know all the scam things. So we bet them all. And uh, at the same time, we came under attack by two to maybe three different botnets. One of them, probably Russian, claimed to be Ukrainian, probably Russian. And just it was just like, all right, well, this is just the passive attacks that we're under right now, and we're just going to have to deal with this and, you know, protect users and all that kind of thing, because, you know, it's not like it's a malicious attack. It's just like, oh, we've got extra attention, so now the botnets are trying to, you know, take advantage, okay, I see how it is, and things like that. But it's just like, the, what would the, the ecosystem in which we exist? So being able to maintain and expand and all those things were big. And it, it is a giant team effort, and it's you know, a lot of people. In there. And like we had Andrew Hara, we worked with him closely, very closely in 2018. The guy is amazing. And then we worked with him very closely again in this eruption. And you know, as soon as we need somebody that's going to be you know on the front taking photos for us, it's going to be him every time. And we've got more guys too that can do it. It's just it's great to have that kind of support for that kind of thing. Uh, Dane brought up something about the mapping and called me a bureaucracy. I believe. <laughs> Another thing besides the lava tube, don't call me a bureaucracy. But, <laughs> but no, the, the, one of the things that Jessica can attest to this, the Department of Interior has really stringent security rules on all of our websites. And so we were working with this program, ArcGIS Online, and we we're putting all our data into it. But our website protocols don't allow us to share the output of that online. So we went through, and this took us a couple of days to get all the connections made. We had to go through all of our IT in Washington, D.C. and everything to get this loop connected. But we connected Civil Defense, which was allowed to put on their website this. And then we looped in Haima and FEMA, and, and, and this, the one that went up on the CD site 
was uh, you can download data like what Dan was saying from that. So our object was to get there. We had to knock down a bunch of security things, and only because the eruption was going on, we had people that normally were saying, no, you can't do that, go, oh, no, we got to get these guys whatever they need. So it was, you know, kind of the eruption did allow us to punch through a barrier that prior to this had been there that slowed down our development of maps. They had to be published on our website before we released the data, blah, blah, blah. And we were able to punch that barrier down and actually get the data out in real time to the public. So that was a big advantage. And uh, it really takes an army of people. There's an army behind all of us that get the information now. Uh, the Hawaii County had, had a huge army with civil defense and all their department heads who came, came together to work and strategize and develop contingency plans. There was also great relationships and partnerships um, with other armies, including uh, Denise, who's here from uh, HPD, and Amy from PTA. Uh, great resources throughout the county that really came together along with the journalism community to get uh, the right story out as, as quickly as possible. So I want to give a big round of applause to this awesome panel. You've done a great job on this 90, 90 minute marathon. I want to thank Kawhi Tracker and, and Two Pineapples uh, for helping us uh, broadcast this out there. And uh, I, I want to give all of you a thank, big thank you big thank you uh, for coming out here on a beautiful afternoon in Hilo to join us in person. Uh, save the date. Nancy, what's the date again in May? May 11th. May 11th. It's a Thursday night. That's going to be an awesome dinner uh, here in Hilo at the, at the Seaside Restaurant. We have other newsmakers. Uh, we have our big Torch of Light event coming up. Um, if you know anyone who's a college student pursuing career in journalism, get them to go to our website and get enrolled in our uh, scholarship process. If you'd love to make a tax-deductible donation to our scholarship foundation, we welcome that. You can do that on the website. Um, and again, all are welcome to join the Press Club. You don't need to be a reporter to join the club. Uh, by joining the Press Club, you help us support our endeavors and help us to have great events like this. So again, thank, thank you to all of you. Jessica, Philip, Chris, Ken, Dane, thank you so much for your time being here. And again, thank you all for coming. Thank you. How'd you like it? <laughs>